It's hard to do that. <laughs> okay, team, we're back online. Would you? Um, I'm just going to touch briefly oh, good, that's right. on um, some of the investment opportunities for council to consider um, as you go into the LTP discussions. And we're just going to touch on this briefly and we, we can come back to this after we've done the case study. Um, for the short term, the low hanging fruits, things that councils can do now is to clarify the maintenance responsibilities among the different parties and to clarify the expectations for the summer management services that the community needs. And then increase plan maintenance to reduce risk and the reactive maintenance um, expenses. And then investment in condition assessment of those assets based on the various maintenance responsibility and expectations. And the network investigations that we've discussed that will ensure that we are looking at all of the various data in an integrated way. And public education awareness is key. Um, and we can start, councils can start doing that now to ensure that the public is aware of their role in managing their stockages mm -hmm. and what the expectations are for managing stormwater. And that would also help inform them about what how what rates they can expect to see to be able to um, to meet the the level of service that they're expecting. Now for the medium year, um, so Binaja mentioned developing the detailed modeling does take time. And so for the medium year, one to three years is developing um, those detailed modeling and integrating that into land use planning and growth and, and the catchment wide assessment as well. That's going to take time for us to integrate of corporate solution that will, that will address the issues. Then for the long term as um, the network improvements that would take time for us to develop and the global stormwater consent, that's also um, one that is in the long term, and then land use planning, ensuring that that, that informs growth. And um, so with that, and we can come back to that to discuss that further, but there are just a, a few questions that no one else to consider as we go into the case study um, is, what do the council feel are the community's priorities for stormwater management? And how is the council and how is the how how are we keeping up with the community's increasing expectation of stormwater management? And then how can we focus on those areas of the community in this long-term plan and in local water done well? And then how can we work with the other parties and do to improve the overall management of stormwater, Greater Wellington, Kiwi Rail, yeah, everyone to improve overall stormwater management. And with that, I will hand over for the case. I will get ready for the case study, but we will take questions. Yeah, it's, it's probably a pretty um, uh, open-ended question, but um, so one of, the, one of the things that we have obviously is that we've got some non-consentable uh, wastewater treatment plants, for instance, that are inhibiting growth uh, in two towns in particular. And um, uh, so it's about prioritising. So um, and that's why I asked the question about the regulatory constraints that we face um, in terms of stormwater. The Natural Resources Plan gave a defined timeline for um, meeting consent conditions um, in terms of stormwater. Um, so from my perspective, how much pressure is this on us yes, uh, to make a decision about spend in particular, but how much of that is more prioritised towards getting consentable um, wastewater treatment plants than stormwater in terms of meeting consent conditions that you say. That's my question to you. Yeah, that's a good question. And I can't I can't talk about the consenting for the wastewater. Um, waste Maybe waste. Uh, Adam could answer that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the yeah. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, the trade-off I suppose. I, I think that's, you know, you know if, what, what is it that you, be useful for us to what it become to come back to so you can make those informed decisions, right? And, you know, we've got our strategy plan team who come and present you know, with those LTP workshops around those um, low, medium, high investment options. And so, you know, what is the information that you are looking to seek to come 
Okay. So what's what's Stephen going to present to us at the end today when we get into this in-depth conversation? Yeah, I think it's a it's a damn good question. Um, it's not one that we can really address and answer here. The the relative merit of investment in wastewater versus investment in stormwater and the interactions between those two things is right on the money in terms of that's the question we, we have to answer. We won't be able to do it here. I think what I think what I'll be asking <clears throat> Wellington Water to do is to when we come to the trade off and understanding what we can afford and we can't do everything kind of conversation, we need to have like a multi criteria analysis of of these different decisions because it's it, yes, it's about affordability, but it's also about regulation. It's also about the health of the lake. It's about iwi Māori interests that are growing. Um, and so what you need to make good decisions is to understand all of the things that are in play against those different um, wastewater, stormwater and drinking water decisions so that, so that you can make the hard decisions and you can demonstrate how you've done that and then you can explain it to your community uh, in a way that makes sense to them. I, I don't know if that's something we could do right now. Okay. No, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, just just seeing how how you'd had the zero to one year and then the up three and then so so uh, it looks like you know you kind of know what the structure is of of what you're looking for, even to have an understanding of where the starting point amount or something because I think when we're being asked to have a look at these things and we can go, this is fantastic, let's move on it, and it's $45 million, okay, let's not. Do you know what I mean? So it's always very, very difficult for us to be able to have a look at at, at, at this, make some... Yeah. And we do need to look at, at off some numbers because we're not here starting to... Yeah. Uh, put money but I think, the table, right? it's, it's around sort of those activities in the short, medium and long term just to get those... So just so then... Understand that... Things like detail modeling is going to take a bit longer, but actually something that could be tackled now is things like public, great public awareness. Right? Yeah, but that's, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's fine. Oh, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, just going back to that last slide that had the um, the short term and, and the long term, I mean, that slide was, was I think that slide was entitled investment options or mm -hmm. opportunities. opportunities. And, and certainly, I mean, I would have been interested to see you know, some dollar values um, attached alongside some of those things, or even if it was just a collective dollar value for the for the short term investment or short term uh, period, because um, and and if if we can't have that right now, I mean, if we're going forward into the LTP discussions, that would be beneficial to see how that matched up alongside the drinking water um, and the waste uh, that we need to do and the wastewater um, upgrades to and compliance that would you know to have dollar values um would be would be valuable going forward i think the, i know the mayor wants to speak and i apologize for jumping in again but i think what's happening at the moment is wellington water is coming to us like for example we've got a wastewater decision that we need to make in in lake ferry in terms of the design of, of a new um collection system out there and wellington water is coming to us and saying look before we even present to you can you tell us what's what's important what's important to your community uh, what kind of criteria would you like to see in our analysis you know affordability proportionality environmental considerations we need to know what the growth looks like out there so we can future proof it etc so so there's a working relationship between us on what the criteria are for us to make decisions you know, and afford, and then affordability is one of those things that you sort of get to down the track. At the moment, it's really hard to give that information in in stormwater, but we'll try and yeah. we'll try and do that in the lead into the LTP. We have to, so we'll right. We will try and do that. We can't do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, I I don't think there's any getting away from it and everybody here knows this. Um, we, we've got big investment requirements in drinking water and in wastewater. There's not going to be much practical talk of what are our investment opportunities here. 
So let's actually not even do it. Let's actually think about all the ways that we can solve a lot of our stormwater problems uh, with things that actually don't cost very much money at all. Now, the first one is um, we had a discussion earlier in the morning about the new granny flat legislation, and somebody came up with the concern that, you know, put up a six square meter roof and it creates stormwater somewhere and it might blow into the neighbors. Uh, we encourage and, and I think we may even oblige people to build concrete pathways beside their houses, which are much bigger than 60 square meters, and they are guaranteed to send flood water into there. We will definitely enjoy the case study assignment. <laughs> I I hold 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 that. Oh no, I'm not going to hold that. Oh, I'm okay. going to hold the floor for a second. <laughs> so we could require people to put pathways in that are permeable instead of impermeable. In fact, we could prevent the type of concrete we use on pathways. We could even stop doing it ourselves on a lot of the roads that we build. There are alternatives that encourage permeability. I forget the exact date last year when um, Councillor Bosley proposed that we um, uh, replace glass, grass berms and a lot of other grass with plants that are best suited to soaking out flood water. The, these are quite low cost things that can be done over time. What's more, they can be done in conjunction with the community who would be quite keen to see um, alternatives to you know, grass deserts. But the other thing we, we can do, um, because you know, when it floods, you know, telling them that we're going to do something next year doesn't actually go down very well. You know? <laughs> so we often do get floods. And part of the problem is that uh, people are a bit unsure about who's responsible for various things and what have you. So, for example, I had um, a lot of people along Brandon Street um, growling at me a wee while ago because now Brandon Street, for those who don't know, it has got some very steep. Brandon Street is actually the case study, so cool. it, it would be yeah, it could, temporary to report back. But it could apply anywhere else. The, 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 the thing was that the ditches or the storm. So, so I, I'm going to stop you there because. The whole next section is an about opportunity threats. for you guys to talk about solutions for Brandon Street. So you're kind of it doesn't, it, it, but you're it doesn't kind of free, Brandon Street. But you're kind of preempting the next section of our workshop. Okay. So I'm gonna be a little bit rude, I'm afraid, and I'm sorry for that, but we we have put together an activity for you to have this opportunity for you to, to communicate and discuss. And think about these types of ideas that you have already jumped to, which mm. is awesome. Um, and then you can have the and you'll have the opportunity to feedback after the workshop. Are you is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think it's rude. Oh, but, okay. Can I ask how long your workshops going for, please? So we um, we're we're over time already, so we've got another twenty five minutes. Okay. So go for it. Yeah, so we're gonna do a quickly skip into the case study and talk about Brandon Street. Um, so as I said, so this is the Brandon Street flooding, and then we're going to do an activity for you to talk about potential solutions. So, um, so you're not at Marie Kimberling sent to you in April about Brandon Street flooding, um, and she, you know, highlighted some key issues. It's multiple times a year that this flooding occurs. Um, there's some high flows off the hillsides um, and really high sediment and debris loads. Um, as was already been mentioned, there's a mixture of pipe sizes. So um, we're gonna. So yeah, so there's there's some small pipes and then some big pipes and then there's some more small pipes. And um, and the system frequently blocks. And um, from her point of view, there wasn't a lot of maintenance. Um, she didn't see regular maintenance. It, it took the residents to call up for things to be maintained. So within um, Wellington Water, we've. Um, had a look at Brandon Street. Um, one of our engineers went out there and met with Marika to talk us around the flooding issues. Um, and um, we found that it is, like she said, it is a big hillside catchment that basically concentrates into a culvert under State Highway 
to and then discharges at the top of Brandon Street. So it's not just the local based flood flooding, it's uh, stormwater, it's from this big hillside catchment. Um, we did a bit of an analysis of some of the events she talked about, and these were really frequent events, kind of one in one year, one in two year um, events. So it corresponds with her reports about multiple times um, a year. Um, we do have quite limited information about aspects um, in Featherston, but from what we've seen, there is a, there is big culverts and then it decreases. The one that goes, I think, under Brandon Street into Dorset Square is at 300 and there's like 400 upstream and that kind of stuff. Um, so that is contributing to the issues. And um, one of the other things is that some of these properties, particularly the ones that are really impacted, um, number 14 and 16, their properties are actually below the road level. Um, and this is quite typical in um, in Featherston and Martinborough, where you've got the road level, you've got your, your road to the swale, and then your property's down here. And so, as we've discussed, water goes to the low point where it wants to go, right? And so that's just straight into the property. Can I just ask about Hart Street? Because the, there's a drain that flows, uh, comes from the state highway down the hill, effectively, yep. and flows into Abbotts Creek. Uh, from there, which is continuously blocked, and it seems, to, and I'm I'm not sure. I know that council years ago tried to put a digger in there to do some to be planted in that reserve and a whole raft of things. So, um, but it doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, focus on on uh, on getting that water coming from the highway across that drain into Abbotts Creek. It all seems to be flowing in down that top end of Brandon Street and around through there. Is that something that you've looked at? So we didn't look so much at Park Street as we were kind of talking to Mariko, who lives on Brown sure. Street. Um, but I guess that's probably another, like another aspect of the, the problem that's really important for. Yeah, because that has overgrown over the years, and it's um, it is restricting the flow to into Abbotts Creek. So yeah, uh, yeah, I think it'd be useful, possibly with Collins and that group to have that as a yeah, like to have a conversation. Like, yeah. You know. Is this asset even mapped? Is yeah. it maintained? Yeah. Question mark. That could be probably not. Solution. Probably oh, not. Something that would come up, right? So, good question. Thank you. I won't interrupt again. Okay. So, well, we're, so we're just going to get handed over to you yes, in a, a couple of minutes. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so, the, so the workshop activity that um, that we're going to do now is um, I'm going to split you guys into two groups. So, these people on my left are group one. Um, and you're going to be looking in this kind of area, so those frequent flooding events, um, understanding the issues and then identifying um, potential solutions, thinking about we're talking about frequent flooding, so we're trying to, you know, stop it being a nuisance, potentially some kind of infrastructure solutions are, are things for you to think about. Um, on my right, you guys are going to be group two, so you're looking at those bigger events, um, thinking that pipes aren't good enough, um, other solutions um, in terms that you could um, come up with to kind of help with those overland flow paths. And then the guys online, um, I dropped a couple of bits of information um, and I was thinking that you guys could talk amongst yourselves and think about those really extreme events. So the kind of cycling Gabrielle or kind of anniversary floods and um, what things do you think would be good to work with the community to get to uh, understand um, and be prepared for those types of events. So that's the plan. Um, you're not going to have 20 minutes because we don't have that much time. Um, so in your groups, there's some information at the back. There's some big pieces of paper for you to write on. Um, we're going to assign a one person to each group to help facilitate the conversation. <laughs> or a couple. So decide where you want to go. Um, but yeah, I'll give you, I think, maybe 10 minutes and then um, and we can um, and then we can have a bit of a feedback session at the end. Right. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Can we group up around here? Yeah. 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 Yeah.